Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the U.S. Naval, Stud Naval Institute and FC International, welcome to day two of West 2022. Before we begin this morning's program, I'd like to make a few administrative announcements. First, we remind you of our health and safety plan. All unvaccinated participants are required, and all participants are strongly encouraged to wear face coverings while at all West Conference events. Thank you for protecting the health and safety of your fellow attendees this week. If you have not already done so, make sure to download the event app sponsored by Deloitte. The QR code can be found on signs outside this room and throughout the exhibit hall. The app is the best place to get all the latest West information and updates. If you have questions which you can't, be, can't find answers for on the app, be sure to stop by the operations center located in the 1900 aisle of the exhibit floor. At the conclusion of this morning's keynote and all other sessions throughout the event, please complete the session survey located in each session within the app. We appreciate your feedback. Visit USNI News and the AFCO website throughout the week for news and summary reports. Additionally, recordings and presentations from the conference will be available on the West Conference website. AFCIA and the U.S. Naval Institute are grateful to Mantech for their sponsorship of this morning's keynote discussion. They are represented here today by Red Hoover, Senior Vice President, Navy Segment Manager, Defense Sector. At this time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Vice Admiral Peter Daly, U.S. Navy Retired, Chief Executive Officer and Publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody's gathering after a first day that was terrific. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Of course, the conference theme is worth mentioning once in a while about committing to new capabilities rapidly enough to meet future challenges. And I think if this is not Yogi Berra, but it's like Yogi Berra, the future's a lot closer than it used to seem. It's, uh, it seems to be right here, right now. It was only in the last few years that we even acknowledged in the national defense strategy that we were now back in an era of great competition, great power competition. And it's only in the last few days that the two chief competitors stacked hands and formed a pact. And we all know that they don't always get along, but the repercussions of them getting along on several levels could be ominous. So what does this mean? Well, there's some questions that this panel this morning will get after. Do the military strategy serve as a good playbook for Congress? Is the military doing an adequate job of telling its story both to the Hill and to the American people? Are our strategies, goals, and resources aligned? These are important questions that our speakers will discuss in this morning's session, and we greatly appreciate having the sponsorship of Mantech for this keynote panel. So I now ask Red Hoover, Senior VP, Navy Segment Manager, Defense Sector for Mantech to come up to the stage and join me and introduce our moderator for this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to be here on behalf of Mantech to introduce our keynote speaker on the, uh, on the topic, American people and American sea power. Are we communicating effectively with American people? Uh, it's a great question, one that's highly relevant to, I'm sure, everyone here today, including Mantech, because we've been supporting the Navy for over 53 years. Our, our very first effort, it was in supporting a man of, uh, of the Navy, and we've been doing it ever since. Uh, however, much has changed since that time, over 53 years ago, in terms of the challenges our nation faces across the, the globe. 
However, the U.S. Navy has stepped up to meet these challenges with sophisticated capabilities. But just how well does the American public understand this transformation and its importance to safeguarding our national security? Here to moderate the discussion is Admiral William Moran, a retired four-star admiral with over 38 years of service and experience. He began his career as a naval aviator and rose to hold command leadership positions at every level of the Navy, including Vice Chief of Naval Operations. He is known for his extensive experience in developing effective leaders and leading teams operating in dynamic and complex environments, and for helping transform the DOD talent management policies and the Navy's fleet readiness and modernization. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our panel moderator, Admiral Bill Moran. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. The voice of God just came on. Ah. So, Pete, you, as usual, you've done a ma magnificent job of stealing all of my introduc introductory <laughs> remarks about why we're here and what we hope to, uh, to get out of this. So we're going to get right to it. And it'll start with an introduction of our two panel members today. I think we've got Rep. Loria yet. Uh, we can see Rep. Loria here. And I think they're going to try to put her on the large screens. But uh, I think mo many of you know uh, Congresswoman Loria, the second district of Virginia representative. Uh, had a career in the Navy, 20-year career, six ships. She's nuclear trained, one of the first uh, female officers that was uh, trained as a nuclear officer, and uh, has been a staunch advocate for the Navy in her time in Congress. And she continues to push our buttons, I think, to uh, try to get us to explain a little bit more about what the Navy and the Marine Corps team bring to the fight and what kind of, what kind of uh, capabilities that, that we need to ensure that we remain a dominant force in the maritime environment. So uh, Rep. Loria, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, and uh, we will get to you here in a second as I introduce uh, Mr. Bridge Colby. Now, Bridge is an author, and I am going to do the uh, Fox News uh, you know, broadcast here on, you better buy this book, because The Strategy of Denial. It's a uh, I got it this morning. I haven't quite finished it, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it looks like a marvelous book. It's really good. Book. It's really good. It's really good. Trust me. <laughs> so uh, uh, Bridge was the former, and I, I'm going to read this because it's a long title, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. What you really need to take away from that is uh, when he came in to the, uh, the administration, Trump administration, he began the process uh, under under Secretary Mattis at the time to build, this, uh, to build the national defense strategy. And he, he was the, the key author in that effort. I know that personally because I watched it happen as the vice chief. And uh, just a marvelous thinker. And, and today he is, um, he is a co-founder and principal at Marathon Institute. Uh, we've had a chance to work together here over the last couple of years and uh, really delighted that you could be here with us to, to kind of give us that strategic view. And we've got some really important guests here. Many of you out in the crowd, it's, it's hard to see who's who. My goal is to get you involved much sooner than most panels because I think what you have to say about this topic is as important as what we have from the two panel members. So to kick things off, uh, we have with us, we have the honor of having Admiral Sam Paparo, our PAC fleet commander here with us, came in last night, I guess, Admiral, and. Uh, we're delighted that you could be here. You're obviously uh, a busy man out there uh, in Hawaii and in the Western Pacific. And because you are in such high demand and you've got a busy schedule, I'm going to cede the first question to you, sir. It, yeah, it'll have a big word in it. Thanks, Admiral Moran. Uh, thank you so much. And panelists, uh, Rep. Loria and uh, Mr. Colby, thanks very much. Uh, in, in my duty position right now, I, we, I actually really do have the ability to visualize what the nation is up against in the threat and the threats to the security and the well-being of, of the nation. And uh, a, an ability to visualize what sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen do every single day 
to uh, deter and to thwart that threat directly to the security and the well-being of 330 million Americans, as well as our allies and partners. And uh, we're getting real and getting better in the United States Navy right now by acknowledging the, the ways in which we can get better and, and uh, being more honest with ourselves. So I'll ask the panelists, uh, what advice do you have for me and for the rest of the United States Navy in enabling, uh, enabling the American public to see, uh, in my own case, the 140,000 people in the Pacific Fleet that work every day to demonstrate to the PRC that today is not the day to upend the international rules-based order, as well as uh, in concert with the 70,000 American Marines in MAR 4 pack. And uh, please, exp please help me visualize the tools we can bring to bear to show the urgency with which the nation has got to make a, a commitment and an investment in the contact layer that will keep us from bringing the very real combat capability that we have that can bring to bear uh, to, uh, to the PRC or to others that would upend the order on which the security and the well-being of the nation uh, lives. Thank you. Great, great question, Admiral. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Laurie, I'll give you the first opportunity to, uh, to try to answer that question, because you've been asking a, the similar questions to the Navy for quite some time. Well, thank you, Admiral Moran and Admiral Paparo. Uh, good to, to see you virtually, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to spend some time with you uh, last summer and understand the, you know, uh, I would say on the ground, but in theater uh, situation in the Pacific and the day-to-day, -day, uh, what I would say is gray zone com conflict and uh, the challenges that you face. Um, as uh, China becomes increasingly aggressive, uh, we see the additional sorties, we see the extremely rapid growth of their Navy. And you know, I think this comes back to something I've talked about uh, quite a few times over my uh, first three plus years in Congress is you know, really having a clear strategy, uh, a clear strategy that can define uh, what the Navy needs and what the purpose of a Navy is. And I think you'd uh, really appreciate USNI uh, publishing the article recently by Thomas Mankin um, when he talked about a strategy. Um, and I'll just quote a little uh, piece of that and saying that a strategy is to array limited resources in space and time to achieve one's aims against a competitor. And that's meant to influence a competitor's decision-making process. And if you look at you know, what a strategy could look like, um, it goes on and quotes Bradford Lee to say that they're strategies of denial. Um, so really impossible for the enemy to achieve their objective strategies of cost imposition. Um, it's unprofitable, but not impossible. Um, and then attack a rival strategy itself or attack political systems. And so when we look at that and we think about a, a, a strategy in the Indo-Pacific, that strategy is maritime. Um, and you know what's a, a little bit uh, frustrating uh, to me and those of us who are constantly um, talking about the importance of the Navy and growing the Navy in response to um, China and the Pacific is that the administration just released the Indo-Pacific strategy. And in that, the Navy was not emphasized. The only Navy that was mentioned was the Australian Navy. Um, I think Bridge in his book has uh, done a great job, uh, his book, Strategy of Denial, um, addressing issues surrounding a strategy. Um, but there's a question of perceptions. And you know, if you, if you go back even quite a bit of, of time, it's, it's really always been hard uh, to convince lawmakers and the public uh, why we need to invest in a Navy. And I, I came across a quote recently um, from Theodore Roosevelt, um, and this was written in 1898 uh, from Theodore Roosevelt to a German diplomat. And he said, um, I'm glad to see that Mahan is having such an influence with your people, and I wish he had more influence with our own. It's very hard to make a nation wake up. Um, so I guess the question for all of us is how do we make the nation wake up? How do you make the nation's leaders wake up? Who, which leaders are those? And whose job is it to wake them up? Um, and so I think conversations like this, what USNI does, what Navy League does with their new uh, Maritime Strategy uh, Center, um, the, the different think tanks and academics, um, we have to get outside uh, of the bubble, essentially, um, where we're all talking to each other, nodding our heads and agreeing um, in violent agreement um, that we need to prioritize and elevate the importance of the need for a Navy. But you know, I think as well, we've really, as a nation, I think woken up to China as the threat 
Um, but I don't think it can just be China, China, China. Um, we have to talk about the risk. And I think what we never talk about is the risk of, of not doing something. What is the risk of not building the Navy we need? What's the risk of not having the forces in Pacific that we need um, to confront the, the threat from China? Um, so I think that you know it's really important that we find that mechanism um, to, to talk about and clearly define the risk. Um, and you know, as a member of Congress, I think that's something that I'm looking for because there's very rarely in a discussion, uh, a conversation about what's the risk of not doing this. Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, Bridge, what do you think? Well, thanks, Admiral Moran. <clears throat> thanks, to, great to be on with Congressman, Congresswoman Luria and, and thank you, Admiral Parr, for your, for your great question. I mean, in a way, I think, um, look, I would defer to the Congresswoman on this point, but it seems to me that action's gonna proceed from the American people seeing a compelling reason why something needs to happen. And I think the Navy, frankly, uh, has a compelling argument. And I mean, I, bas I, mean, I didn't write the, the strategy of denial or I didn't work on the national defense strategy to benefit the Navy per se, but it seems to me that the logic of what our country needs to do leads to a stronger Navy. I mean, it, 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 you know, Asia, and we see this, this issue very acutely right now to the point that Congresswoman was talking about, about risk and trade-offs, is the excessive focus on Europe, which is there are real threats in Europe, but the fundamental reality for Americans, and I think Americans do understand that, you see that I think in the politics today, is that China is the primary challenge. A, because it's as large an economy as we are and it's still growing. And secondly, Asia is the primary theater. And from our perspective, to boil it down very, very succinctly, Asia is a maritime theater for us. There's a reason why our defense perimeter, which I go into in the book, is along the first island chain and how important it is to defend at the first island chain. And moreover, if we're going to deny block China from dominating Asia. Because if China dominates Asia, you know, forget about LeBron James, forget about John Cena, that's gonna be all of our lives. You know, they're gonna they'll be able to turn off the bank accounts or the social media accounts of anybody they want to. And if they've got 50% or more of global GDP under their thumb, that's gonna be our lives. And I don't think people want that, and I think there is a strong national intuition. Um, but if we're gonna block that, we're gonna need a strategy of denial, and, and co the Congresswoman has talked a lot about that at th this point. Co Congressman Gallagher has been very eloquent on this as well. Um, it, you know, which is that we, we, cost, strategies that rely on cost imposition, on horizontal escalation, on economic sanctions are not credible against China. They're not gonna be effective. And the point here is that this is gonna require a Navy and an Air Force and a Space Force that can operate effectively and deny Chinese invasion or, or assaults in the first island chain, which is a politically low standard, but very demanding operationally. So my, my argument to the Navy, and what, and what I've been struck, to be frank, that I don't see as much from the Navy is it should be a focus on war fighting, shape the force accordingly, and get the force to where it needs to be. Don't talk about you know, sea lanes or trade, maybe that was something that made sense 10 or 15 years ago, but the nation needs a denial force and that's gonna be a Navy and an Air Force and a Marine Corps that can, that, that can do that. And I think that what will follow from that is the need for a very strong Navy and Marine Corps. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because we have been telling ourselves for a long time that, that our conversation with a country needs to be about trade, needs to be about sea lanes of communication, needs to be about the things that impact the economics of the American public, and maybe they will wake up. Um, you're suggesting something different, and so how would, how would you go about describing what that war fight looks like that the public can understand? It's that the, a war in Asia would be, of course, a military conflict, but the stakes would be about the economy and what it would mean for the Americans. So you go back historically, even Japan in, in the Pacific War, they were, their no, notional war aims were the greater uh, East Asia co-prosperity sphere, a, a geoeconomic zone. That's what the war would be about. But what would decide the war would be our military power. So it's true that trade and economic leverage is ultimately what the goal is. But what, what the Navy needs to, to be able to do, and the Air Force with it, and the, and, the, and the Marines, is to be able to deny. And that is a very high standard. And I think if the, I, I, my, my instinct is that there's these kind of vague generic terms about sea lanes of communication and stuff that people can't connect to. And obviously the Navy is not sized and shaped to do, actually do that. It's not a constabulary force, it's a war, it's a sea control and power projection force. That makes, it, I think you talk concretely about that, and then people will, I think people will get it and, and support it at the end of the day. Okay. Pete, you had a question. And I'd invite the audience to just go to the mic. If I see you there, I'm gonna get, uh, get to you here in the, in the midst of the conversation. Go ahead, Pete. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank our panel and our moderator again on behalf of FCA and uh, the Naval Institute. But a question I have is, are we too wedded to documents and a series of 
informational steps that are now outdated. Um, for instance, if you read the Navy's strategy documents, they read frighteningly like they did 20, 25 years ago. You know, we're assuring allies, we're deterring, we're doing this, we're doing that. And those are important things, but it strikes me that we might need different levels of documents for different things. Like, I believe that we're not saying, and Rep. Luria talked about risk, we're not saying in stark terms, this is what we really need. It's left to the reader to fill in the blanks. It's like a mathematical theorem or something. It doesn't say, this is what we need. And if it's classified, so be it. And then if it is, do we need a separate document that makes the case direct to the American people? Events of the last few years have really shown that that works, going direct. So I just put that out to the panel and ask, is it time to change these documents? So, Congresswoman Luria, I think you probably are anxious to jump on this, this one. Um, one. One of the things I think Pete's getting at here is when you go up on the Hill to testify in an unclass environment uh, about the budget, you know that those folks wearing the uniform have to testify about the president's budget. And it comes with limitations. You know, how much top line did they get and how do you pull all those threads together to, to, to build a program that's going to be acceptable? So how, how do you get at Pete's point here and what would you like to see more of or less of in order to, to answer that question? Certainly a topic I've thought a lot about and I've uh, referenced back some comments that the former Navy Secretary John Lehman made uh, quite a few times. I mean, I think, you know, if we had the foundation of a strategy, um, that strategy can drive requirements, which then drive the POM, which drives the budget. And then if we look at the budget is, you know, sort of driving the next step of uh, investments, that's readiness, man, train and equip, acquisition. But it's really all jumbled up right now. You know, like you said, it starts out with what can we afford? You know, so right now there's, you know, reporting on what the top line might be for the upcoming budget. And then within that, it'll get split up within the Pentagon. The Navy will have its chunk of that budget and come to Congress essentially with, you know, a proposal of, of you know, here's what we uh, basically think we can get uh, with what we think our top line is going to be. So um, in all of this discussion, rarely have ever do people talk about risk. Um, and, you know, a lot of times a quote that Donald Rumsfeld made comes to mind um, where he says we have to pick and choose and the degree to which we pick and choose um, and we are wrong, uh, those results can be devastating. And so since the process is backward, there's, 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 there's. into something that I've been looking at recently because there's a, a chairman's risk assessment that's actually required to Congress uh, each year. Um, and I, I went to go find that document and found that the last time it was submitted to Congress was in August of 2020. It's due each year on February 15th. So it was actually submitted six months late um, after the budget process was finished that year and then not the following year. Um, and, you know, you would uh, think that, you know, if the chairman's risk assessment um, lays out uh, the, in effect, these things. And, you know, if you look at, at Title 10, it says that it should assess, um, you know, to what extent that um, the current or future risk increases, decreases, stays the same as a result of budgetary priorities and trade-offs. Um, and as I reviewed the most recent version of this document, it, it in fact doesn't do that. Um, in, you know, so as a lawmaker, I, I really do want to be able to understand the risk associated with the budget that's being submitted um, and the document that's designed to do that and tell us that risk is either given to us you know, after the budget process is done or, or, or not given to us um, at all. And so, you know, looking at this, I think DOD is not doing actually what's required by law that would benefit lawmakers um, and in, then, in, uh, you know, uh, consequence the, the American people as far as defining what the risk is with regards to the investments we're making. And um, so one of the things that I've, I've thought about is, you know, in the three NDA cycles, the three years I've been in Congress, we've never had a briefing, classified or unclassified it, uh, on the chairman's risk assessment. Um, so I do think that there are, you know, avenues that are actually already written into the law that would, you know, have the Department of Defense come to Congress and spell out that risk. Um, so, you know, many times I, I said in the hearings for the NDAA, um, and I've, I've 
joked a few times with the, the CNO, I've said, you know, is today the day you're going to come to Congress and tell us what you really need? Um, and I, I do understand the, the constraints of his position in the Secretary of the Navy's, but I do think that there is a, a vehicle that already exists by which that can be clearly communicated to lawmakers. Great. I would just add, I mean, I think I basically agree, but I think the Navy and the, and the sea services could be, should be much more concrete and much more clear. And I think actually General Brown, the chief of staff of the Air Force, has set the right tone, which is accelerate, change, or lose, to Congresswoman Luria's point. There is a risk in inaction, and it, a lot of it tends to be kind of lost in these clouds of sort of, uh, you know, caveated phrases about bearing risk and so forth. But, you know, right now, we are dealing with a situation, I'm in a debate with uh, former uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton on Twitter, and my basic, one of my basic critiques of him is that he's not reckoning with the reality of what I call military scarcity. Well, military professionals know that we don't have enough heavy bombers or munitions or SSNs or whatever to, do, to simultaneously or even relatively concurrently fight two major wars. And this is like, this is not even something that Bolton, and not to go out, but th th that is sort of registering on his wavelength. And this is, uh, honestly, this is partially, I think, the, the, the responsibility of the, of the Defense Department is to ground foreign policy debates and decisions in military reality. And I look, you know, right now, if, you know, the, the Taiwan is the, is the, is the, is the sort of the, the, the tip of the spear is not the right term, but is the most urgent uh, situation. What do we need, what does the Navy need to, and the, to be able to win a Taiwan fight at a reasonable cost and risk? Because if the Navy can, the, and the Sea Services and the Air Force and the Space Force can do that, well then we can defend Japan and the Philippines and so forth. Now you can, you can glom some of that from David Ockmanic or Mark Montgomery or, or Clint Hynode from the Air Force is pretty clear about it, but why isn't, you know, and General Berger is, is clear about what the Marine Corps needs, why isn't the Navy clear? And that, to the Congresswoman's point, I think it's a real possibility that the Chinese move this decade, I mean, don't take it from me, ask Phil Davidson, he said by 2027, there's a, the Chinese at least want to have the option, option wrapped up, but they may move before that especially if the Russians are tying us down in Europe. And if that happens and we lose, would anybody want to have said, I didn't ask for what I needed and I wasn't clear? Instead of you know, the obsession about the ship numbers, ship numbers are important, but that's got to be at the end process to me of you know, we need a denial force. You know, from, uh, we could use bows and arrows and rocks in theory to deny a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, but in reality, it's going to be a different kind of force and the nation you know, a, a, an ounce of prevention now will be so much better than a pound of, of failure and, and, and full-scale conflict later. And so I would just urge a much more clear and concrete, and I think people will understand. It's intuitive. And in a sense, I, that's one of the things I tried in this book, is not to make it a technical military analysis, because a lot of the military analysis gets lost and is very within the defense bubble. Um, but what I tried to do in this book, and not to refer to it, I mean, but, but is to say, this is stuff that everybody in the country is going to have a stake in, whether directly they could be fighting, they could have family fighting, they could, you know, imagine what inflate will happen to inflation if there's a war with China. So people should front load that reality, and I think, I think, it's, in, I think it's incumbent upon the military leadership to make that as clear as possible. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling that at the luncheon today, Admiral Paparo is going to articulate that clarity with tremendous accuracy. So no pressure, sir, no <laughs> pressure. Um, so let's go to the, the audience again. Mike, go ahead. So I, I think the thing that we need to talk about is what I like to call the elephant in the room. Uh, in 2010, Admiral Mike Mullen, when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that the greatest threat to our national security is our national debt. Uh, we just crossed 30 trillion in the last year uh, we added another six trillion. Um, all these discussions are interesting, but if, if we don't have a consensus uh, on, in, in our nation about what's important and the debt and the challenges the debt causes, um, how, can we, how can we get to where we need to be? So I'd like to get your thoughts on the threat posed by the national debt and our unconstrained spending. Yeah, so Congresswoman Loria is back in D.C., I think, because of a vote that's coming up maybe on the budget, um, which I'm sure the crowd would love to get any insights you might have, if you can share it. But, I mean, this is a perfect question for you in terms of, uh, you know, you, you obviously are having these discussions inside of Congress about the debt, and then how, how do you balance that against the need on the military side? Yes, well, 
Um, you know, I, I really do appreciate you accommodating my uh, participation remotely, um, yeah. as all in the room might be well aware. Um, the continuing resolution that's currently in effect uh, expires tomorrow. So I was a little uh, concerned about flying to the West Coast the day before. Um, we, we may have needed to vote on uh, extending that continuing resolution, or of course, would have been much preferable um, to, to vote and finally pass the budget because, you know, it is not the way to continue to operate, you know, to, to not fund the government until six months into the fiscal year. Um, the House has already passed that. It's kind of uh, stuck up in the Senate for a variety of reasons, but anticipate that that continuing resolution will get extended again um, through uh, around March 11th. Um, but there is a, it's seemingly a clear path forward um, to, to go ahead and um, you know, pass funding uh, for the remainder of the year. But we obviously understand that you cannot continue to operate under a continuing resolution for an entire year. Um, and that has huge impacts um, on you know, the defense, military, shipbuilding, and ship repair um, specifically, which are obviously exaggerated here um, in Hampton Roads, where we're building and repairing ships every day. Um, you know, I think that the COVID pandemic um, did necessitate a federal response uh, to make sure that we could you know, take a round term on, uh, on the economy, you know, after this quick, uh, you know, shutdown that we saw almost two years ago. Um, and there has been a very large amount of uh, federal spending in response to that. Um, what I would say now is that, you know, it's a slog. It's a fight every day in Congress. And the fact that the continuing resolution um, is still in effect to this point in the year has a lot to do with this question of discretionary versus non-discretionary defense versus non-defense um, spending. Um, and, you know, I think one of the few people on my side of the aisle who's been just continuously pushing and pushing and saying, you know, all these other things are important, but what's really important um, is, you know, plussing up the defense budget. We wanted to see three to five percent real growth last year that didn't come over um, in the budget from the White House. And, you know, I with others worked um, across the aisle with the ranking member Mike Rogers from Alabama to make sure we could add that 25 billion. We could emphasize really the things that the Navy needs because we got a budget last year that essentially wanted to cut 15 ships. Um, decommission seven cruisers over 800 VLS cells, you know, decommission uh, four LCS like 10 years into their service life. And the list was long um, and, you know, really didn't match up uh, with what we had been hearing from Navy leadership and, and DOD leadership over the course of um, our hearings last year. Um, but to, in my mind, it was really merely uh, stopping the hemorrhaging um, as far as the defense budget goes. So, I mean, it is a, a conversation that's very difficult with competing factions, you know, both, on both sides of the aisle in the House, between the House and the Senate, and how we balance this out to come to an agreement. But I'm very confident that, you know, in this year's budget, we will be able to maintain um, that $25 billion plus up and, you know, still waiting for numbers for next year, but not overly optimistic that they're going to be enough um, to match inflation, um, as well as the increase that we need to see for real growth. So, um, you know, I think that it is a debate that we need to have. I mean, I think that we need to shift more of our focus and our resources to defense, um, because ultimately, and as Bridge has mentioned in his comments, you know, the cascading impacts of a conflict, if China were to try to take Taiwan by force in the next six years, now five years per Admiral Zakhali and Noah Davidson, you know, that has an impact on everything, everything within our economy. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that maybe none of this stuff really matters if we can't get the defense part right. Yeah. So a lot of urgency out there, to your point, and whether this piece of that urgency is more important than the others is the real challenge for, for the administration and Congress. Yeah, all, all I would add is that I think, um, you know, one of the uh, sort of arguments that I get in is with uh, sort of the school that says we should, you know, I don't want to deal with this this problem. I don't want to deal with the problem of military scarcity. And I think, to, to Congresswoman Loria's point, I mean, 3 to 5 percent real growth is basically just to keep us in the game. And I think the reality is, frankly, based, and again, I don't know, I mean, it's in theory you could say let's double the defense budget, not that you're saying this, but people make, kind of make this argument, but that's not practical. And I think the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force, they need to be forward-leaning and not necessarily go with the traditional log rolling. And of course, I mean, the Army is the elephant in the room. I mean, I think the Army does have an important long-term role in the Pacific, especially as China becomes able to project power against, you know, the Philippines and Korea and so forth. But I mean, I think, you know, it, it should be kind of a, a forceful debate and the, and the Congress should play an active role in saying, and I think it's, you know, the Congress gets a lot of flack, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the panel with Congresswoman Luria, but I mean, the Congress gets a lot of flack for stasis, but if Congress gets 
sort of the status quo from the department and from the administration, it's hard, to, it's hard for them to say, oh, no, actually, you should completely do that. Whereas if the, if, you know, and that's one of the things we were trying to do the national defense strategy is change, you know, with the, the you and, the, and Admiral Richardson and Admiral Munch played such a critical role, Admiral Moran, in that, in that process and, and that vision of what, where we needed to go. The idea was to give people a clear narrative. And to Congresswoman Loria's points about risk, I mean, one of the things I was proudest about about that document in the, in the you know, the actual document is the acknowledgement of risk. And it actually, it was a disappointment to me that that wasn't publicized because that makes it more credible. But I think people in this room know that this, you know, we can't do everything. We need to build this kind of force first and make sure we can do that. Um, but I think it's, that, 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 that narrative needs to be much crisper and clearer. And it sort of shocks me that we're still at the point in our foreign policy discussion where people aren't really grappling with that reality. Yeah, good. Sir, go ahead. I, I don't recognize you, so can you state who you are, please? Uh, sure. I'm Jeff Shogel with Task and Purpose. Uh, yeah. I have a question for Congresswoman uh, Luria. The Navy recently tweeted, our sea denial exercises with naval expeditionary integration and littoral allies prepares us to counter potential adversarial aggre aggressive actions. Do you feel the Navy has problems communicating to the American public in plain English what security threats are and how to counter them. Thank you. Well, my answer is yes, and you might have seen my response or retweet of that was, you know, kind of to quip, you know, I was in the Navy for 20 years. I really don't even understand what this means. You know, of course I can decipher what the words actually mean, but the truth is, is that, you know, if someone who spent their entire career serving in the Navy doesn't think this is a clear, you know, message and way to, uh, you know, emphasize the importance of what we're seeing here, what we're seeing in this, this picture, um, you know, just Last week, we saw three nations, three NATO countries, our aircraft carriers all operating together, um, the US, the French, and the Italians. And this is the largest naval force we've seen of NATO assembled in the Mediterranean, if not ever, certainly since the Cold War. And it's something the Navy really needs to be out there talking about, the importance, the role, the, you know, and again, in the Pacific, we had two carrier strike groups operating with the JMSDF. And I do know that Admiral Aquilino, Admiral Paparo are really, you know, trying to be more visible about the operations that we're doing. Um, but I do think that the Navy, you know, if you want to just sell the average person who might happen to be following, you know, Navy on Twitter, um, it, it needs to be in plain language and they need to understand, you know, that this is, you know, showing the American flag. This is maintaining world order, not to use the term that bridge, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's not fond of, I get, you know, the, um, <laughs> you know, the sea lanes of communication is also very esoteric. You know, does the average person know what choke points are? Um, but if you can say like, look, here we are operating in a place that two thirds of the world's oil flows through, or when we saw the, um, ever given stuck in the Panama canal, I was sorry, the Suez canal, for example, you know, the impact that that could have had on the global economy, had they, you know, taken longer, uh, to free that ship. Um, you know, those are kinds of things that, you know, the average person just isn't thinking about on a daily basis. So I think the Navy's communication should just constantly beat that drum about how important having a Navy is and the role that they're playing around the world in all aspects of our, our life and national security. Yeah, you know, to, just to be sarcastic for a moment, maybe we speak like that to confuse our adversaries more than we can do ourselves. <laughs> right. But, um, and, and Bridge, no, I mean, no, I, that point was made, yeah. you, you made it earlier with your comments. Yes, sir, go ahead. Good morning, Craig Madsen, Director of Aquas, 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 Aquas. About Ukraine using potentially intelligence releases, are we appropriately using classified information to tell our story at the Navy level? I know there's an appropriate balance that we should take. Do you feel that we are doing that appropriately? And second, to what end? What are the metrics that we are using? What is our measure of success with communications? Do we expect to change the one-third, one-third balance, uh, maintain or increase the budget, get more ships, change in domestic versus uh, military spending? What is our measure of effectiveness in the classified information utilization? Thank you. I'm going to turn to, to Bridge on this one, if you could address it from your former life yeah. and maybe some other things you're thinking about. Well, thank you. I think in the second one, I mean, for lack of a better thing, it should be a scenario assessment of whether the Navy and the, and the Joint Force is able to prevail within the realistic kind of cost and risk tolerances of the American people. Um, and that should be the driver. 
and it's not ship numbers, it's not amount of the budget. I mean, if we can stay with one third, one third, one third and achieve that, then okay. But that's really, and that's, you know, this sort of scenario, I mean, as um, uh, for, uh, Matt Donovan, who is the, uh, in the Air, senior official in the Air Force, he said, you know, basically the, the logic here is go, to, go back to threat-based planning. Okay, what's the threat and what's our political goal and what are the political constraints? Are we doing well? And so that's what I'm, what I'm talking about in the Taiwan scenario. There's a lot of this, there's a lot of uncertainty about what exactly is needed. And so people end up talking about strategic ambiguity. The diplomatic piece is not the critical piece. Xi Jinping is not going to sleep and saying, oh, they've, have they said something different on Taiwan necessarily. He's, he's going to make a decision based on whether he thinks it's feasible or not at the end of the day. Obviously, it's complicated a little bit, but that's basically it. And so I think that's what we, you know, that's what, and, and if there's, to, the, to uh, Congressman Luria's point about the chairman's risk assessment, that would be a good thing to know, is are we in the, are we in the red on that point? You know, and that's, and that's, what, what, uh, that's what I would use. And to the extent that that can be more public, I mean, I, the, the last National Defense Strategy Commission, I had some positive and some negative assessment of it. But one of the things I did think it did well was it was clear on the risks. You know, it talked about the potential for failure and the potential for defeat. And I think that's important so that people can have a chance to redress. And at the end of the day, if, if not, at least there's some accountability. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi there, William Hinckley, Private Sector Maritime Intelligence. Uh, we're talking about building up the Navy for uh, a big conflict in the future. I say that there's currently a economic warfare happening right now on a smaller scale with all of the militia boats uh, illegal fishing going around, and this is like a death by a thousand cuts. And I'm not sure how this is something that um, the U.S. is addressing. It seems like something we don't do well with in the, in the past. Yeah, it was, uh, if you had been to Admiral Fogo's panel yesterday, they, did, they talked extensively about that piece. But I'd like to ask Congresswoman Lurio, you've operated out there, you've seen this uh, real time. What, what are your thoughts on that question? Well, I think I'll pivot back to what I said earlier is, you know, it feels like there truly is a gray zone conflict day in and day out when you see recently, you know, hundreds of Chinese, quote unquote, fishing boats, um, maritime militia vessels, you know, anchored um, in Whitsun Reef um, in the Philippines, um, uh, the illegal fishing, all of those things are things that I think we need to address more aggressively. And I also think when you talk about uh, the previous conversation we had about, you know, how do you convince the American people um, that these investments are important? It includes not just the Navy, but the Coast Guard. Um, and I feel like there hasn't been an advocate in the Coast, in the House uh, for the Coast Guard who's been as strong as say Senator Wicker has been uh, specifically in the Senate. But increasing our Coast Guard operations within the AOR is incredibly important. Um, I think we need to look at, you know, what are the, the tools the Coast Guard needs um, in order to be more present um, and more um, involved in these activities, you know, below the zone of, uh, below the threshold of conflict in this, you know, sort of gray zone area that we have and making sure that we get the resources there. And, you know, I think that's also an area where perhaps those lawmakers who are not as inclined to say, we're going to support defense directly, but we do believe in, you know, enforcing these, um, you know, international fishing violations, human trafficking, kind of all of the things um, that are sort of more, you know, I'd say squishy <laughs> things, but the things that are very, very important that the Coast Guard does and brings to the table, I think are important that, you know, we can also make sure that we're making the right investment in, in those things as well. And can I pivot back and just make a quick comment on something Bridge um, said in the last response? Sure. Um, so I, I do, you know, truly think that in the response to the last question, you know, the ultimate goal, although the questioner did ask about things sort of internally that we could perhaps influence, you know, within the budget and spending decisions, I think the ultimate goal is to make sure that what information we're sharing makes G think that it's not worth the cost and he's not going to be able um, to successfully in, you know, in, invade Taiwan by force without consequences. And Bridge um, mentioned the fact uh, about strategic ambiguity, and this is something I've been talking a lot about and thinking that we truly do need to change our policy on that. Um, I think that as long as there's a question and whether it's very gray as to whether the United States would or would not respond, um, it, it doesn't put us in the strongest position to deter uh, China's invasion of Taiwan. And another aspect of that is I truly think the president's hands are tied. Um, if you look at the War Powers Act, the Taiwan Relations mm -hmm. Act, um, there is really nothing giving us authority to act essentially in a deterrent way um, if the Chinese were to 
start an invasion. The Straits is 110 uh, nautical miles, roughly. And there is no way um, that the president, the administration is going to be able to come to Congress and receive a decision, um, the authority to use force to prevent China's uh, taking Taiwan um, in the time frame that it would cost, it would allow the, the Chinese could cross the strait. So um, I do really think that there, it is time for us as a policy position um, to look at changing that strategic ambiguity to more of a policy of strategic clarity saying that the United States will react in order to maintain the status quo. Yeah, great point. Bridge, um, Congresswoman just brought up a good point. In, in recent months, Proceedings has done a marvelous job of publishing a number of articles on uh, sea power, mm -hmm. really good articles. But they've engaged in a pretty significant debate about presence, not presence, uh, by some people who are you know, pretty knowledgeable about how this works. What, what's your view on this presence issue, given the fact that we are smaller still than we were before 9-11 as, as a total size, and there's still got the, all these requirements out there. Just look at where the Navy is today. I mean, Admiral Paparo will talk a lot about what's going on in the Pacific. We know what's going on in the Med and the Atlantic, and then you still have the Middle East. How can we not have presence uh, and, and still be able to preserve the force to be able to fight the fight that may, may occur wherever it may be? The Navy should be focused on one thing, which is basically to the exclusion of everything else, which is to be able to fight and defeat China over Taiwan and then maintain the strategic deterrence mission, of course, which is connected to it. I honestly think, I think the Department of Defense should be doing three things. It should be preparing to fight and win over Taiwan. It should be doing the strategic deterrence mission, and it should be uh, having a low-cost counterterrorism option, and if you're, uh, uh, operation. And if you're doing something else, you should be stopping. I mean, the, the example that I like to use is the famous war movies of today would be about Afghanistan or something like that. The famous war movie of the time when we just about won the Cold War was about Top Gun, where they were in a training school because they were training, it doesn't mean that they have to be out in the Pacific all the time, because they could be at home honing their skills for high-end conflict, but it, it's clear what's happened with Seventh Fleet is it's been overused. And in a sense, I mean, one of the things we tried to do in the NDS was simplify. So I, there's no talking about assuring allies or responding to threats, or there's the possible credible defeat within the political constraints is the mission of the armed forces, because we've gotten so distracted, frankly. And I think a lot of these missions, honestly, came up after the end of the Cold War to justify force structure. And, you know, that not, wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but there's a lot of exercises that we don't need to be doing. There's a lot of presence missions that we don't need to be doing. And I think we are running the force ragged, and, and, the, and those COCOM uh, demands then also go back into the force development process, as you would know far better than I, because, well, you know, CENTCOM and SOUTHCOM need this, so we should keep this, force. Mm -hmm. no. It should, again, it should be that scenario. How are we doing? And then if we have stuff left over, then we should be thinking about how to contribute to a Europe scenario. But it's still, it's still towards war fighting. So, I mean, I'm very sympathetic, generally, to Bob Work's view. Where I differ, I think, with, with Bob, as I understand it, and I, I, my understanding is his views may have evolved on this, is I think combat credible forward presence is critical, and Admiral Paparo mentioned the contact layer and the blunt layer, and what the Marines are doing I think is critical in the sense that we want to pose operational but also political dilemmas on the Chinese where they will face not only forces that can operate from range, B-2s or B-52s or B-1s, but also forces within the, the, the theater that are going to be at risk, but that can, uh, in a cost-effective and credible, operationally credible way, combat credible, to go back to the discussions we had yeah. in, 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 in the Pentagon, that are able to survive and be resilient and operate in an effective way, but also uh, could, can go after red with anti-ship cruise missiles or even land attack, anti-air, and then are also basically in this kind of uh, position where they're working with allies. So the assurance part is important, but it's connected again to the warfighting so that U.S. and Japanese forces, why don't we have an, a, a combined forces command with Japan? You know, Japan is changing rapidly. I mean, you know, things are moving real fast. And, the, you know, Japanese prime ministers are saying things that people would never have thought of. And now, so we need to make sure that our, our, our organizations and our, our ways of thinking and our force structure is also changing. So that's, that's sort of the way that I, I look at the, at, the, at the presence. Yeah, and back to your point about how you communicate that clearly and crisply is, is important. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, hi, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, Mel Yokoyama, president of Akamai Intelligence. Uh, the question I have is about the high-end conflict readiness. So if you look back at you know, World War II, we were a very good industrial base for production. 
of industrial uh, capabilities. Going into this fight, when you're looking at, you just walk the halls here, cyber, automation, artificial intelligence, you know, all these high-end uh, sort of capabilities. When it comes to the defense industrial base, I like to use my kids as an example. They tried to go to college uh, for STEM, they applied, but most of the curriculum was impacted because of the foreign, specifically Chinese students coming in. So if you look at overall, it's not a whole of government, it's a whole of nation readiness. So I like to talk about not horizontal, but vertical. But vertical also means our people, because that's, that's the strength of our, of our nation. So how do you see us you know, increasing that readiness when it comes to our de defense industrial base, specifically the next generation of folks that will be behind us? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Congressman Loria, do you see anything or is anything in Congress occurring to address these issues with uh, respect to the, the people and the readiness side of this really emerging capability that's uh, affecting us every day right now? Well, you know, I would certainly say uh, that, you know, all of this discussion is underpinned by the people, um, you know, that, that operate the fleet that maintain and build our ships that come up with the new technology. And so, you know, when we talk about defense, I think workforce development and education and increased education in STEM always fit into that discussion and are um, frequently mentioned and frequently referenced most of the time with the shipbuilding and ship repair um, and that kind of uh, competency in, in the trades. Um, but, you know, another thing that I'd like to focus on that, that always comes to mind in these hearings, you know, a lot of people come before Congress and say, you know, the next frontier is AI and quantum computing. And, you know, this really is reflected, I think, in the budget we got last year, which is this divest to invest strategy. You know, we're talking about all of these things that might and might exist in the future, um, but they don't translate to a weapon system and a capability that we have today that we can actually purchase today or operate today yeah. um, in order to confront our most pressing threat. Um, so I do think that we should not uh, overlook some of the absolutely more basic foundational things that we can use to be effective in countering the Chinese um, for only focusing on the very high end things. And, you know, I asked in an Air Force hearing last year, you know, for the Air Force, what are you investing in as far as offensive mine laying capabilities? You know, what are the kinds of things that we can do that, you know, maybe some people in the back of their mind think, well, that's pretty old school. But the truth is, there are a lot of these things that could be very effective in the current environment. So I think that we cannot overly focus on new capabilities that are not mature yet and sacrifice the readiness and the you know, continued investment in platforms that we have and we can use today. And if you look at what Admiral Aquilino and Davidson said, you know, it's six years, now five years, um, that this could happen. We have to fight with what we have today while we still are also developing those new capabilities for later. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, yeah, if I could, I, mean, I completely agree. I mean, I think maybe 10 years ago, you could argue that we should prioritize capability, long-term capability investments, but I, I used to talk, joke about this in the Pentagon, is China's a long-term problem, but now China's a long-term problem like acute heart disease. Like, you'll be lucky if you get through the, the acute phase, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta get, take a statin right now, and then you'll survive. But we are in the window, and so the, I agree. I mean, yes, I wanna invest. We clearly need to invest in the new capabilities, um, but we're already within this, this window. And I think Representative Lurie is so right about use what's available. Like, we don't, it doesn't, there's this idea that China's a high-tech power, so we need only high-tech things. No, no, mines are a perfect example where that can create a lot of difficulties, especially integrated with higher level capabilities. And I defer to, of course, your, your expertise on this. But I think that's exactly right. But I think we need to now be, where I would take risk across the program or in our foreign policy is in other theaters, in other missions, not in the time frame of, of the China fight. So I mean, we want to me, why would we be penny wise, pound foolish when we know that this is something that could happen? The one other thing I, I would just say that I think is relevant is, in a, especially to this audience, is I would not lack confidence about asserting the importance of the M in the dime, you know, in a, as a rhetorical, because I think there is, a, in the last generation, across the spectrum, the political spectrum, people just sort of take for granted our military dominance. And so now there's a, ten, and there's an almost an apologetic quality I find with, with a lot of military who are saying, well, yes, I, the D, I, and E are so important. And it's like, well, the DI and E are only going to be important if, if we've got the M in a good place. And I think this is not a partisan point. I mean, I'm a Republican. I know the Congresswoman is a Democrat. You know, nobody has an interest in China dominating the region, you know, and, and that's going to be bad for all of us, whatever our political orientation. And so I don't think M, the importance of M is not a 
partisan or political thing. It's something that we all need to get, need to get right. And I just, I think it's really important that military leadership and people in this community don't be shy about asserting that because it's sort of, it's so, uh, the other stuff is, you know, soft powers ain't gonna matter if, as Chairman Mao himself said, power comes out of the barrel of a gun. So clearly they think that way. Yeah. I think we've got time for, thank you for that question. We've got time for one or two more of your questions. One more quick, one more question. quick question. So I'm going to use the uh, the, the congressional uh, testimony um, instructions uh, for the two panelists. You get to say yes or no um, <laughs> okay. in, in response. I'm just kidding. But go ahead, sir. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, Steve Alonzo, CTO of Marine Electric Systems. And I think what the American people don't understand right now and the stars aren't telling you is how weak and single source the indust, uh, industrial base has become. Yeah. Uh, I know you're one of our best friends on House Armed Services. But I mean, what we see from 2014 onward is loss of some 25,000 companies. Um, I build horseshoe nails. None of my things are important. But if my 300 NSNs disappear tomorrow, not one carrier, not one submarine, and most of the surface ships couldn't move. And we're just a tiny company. Uh, the airplanes I used to fly had 500,000 parts built by the lowest bidder, thousands of companies. And it's not about ships and it's not about planes. This will be a come as you are war. It's about being able to deploy the forces we have and to be able to sustain the war when we don't have a supply chain. And that's what the people don't understand. It's not about the ships, it's not about the planes, it's being able to sustain and win the next war. Yeah, great point. Congresswoman Lori, would you like to address that topic? I, I know you've been pretty passionate about it on the Hill. Go ahead. No, you know, I agree completely. Um, you know, it's not always just about investing in the newest, shiniest thing um, and the latest technology. We really have to make sure that we can operate and maintain um, the ships, aircraft, all of the equipment that we have today. So I think ensuring the supply chain, understanding those vulnerabilities, the single source for certain um, things that, you know, perhaps because of the age of the technology we're using are, are becoming obsolete or the suppliers are not um, in place anymore. So I think it is a very important effort, and I think that it is underway within the Defense Department um, to identify those particular items. Um, but it's something that we can certainly do more work on. Um, I know that during COVID, this was a big concern um, of the Department of Defense, making sure that we didn't, you know, because of the situation um, during the pandemic, lose any of these suppliers. Um, and additional resources were given in the CARES Act on both occasions to make sure that our um, defense suppliers that were critical to the supply chain received those resources to essentially be able to continue operating under very difficult uh, conditions. And I think we need to continue that analysis every day to make sure, you know, that your 300 NSNs, um, you know, cannot go away because they're critical to the operation of um, you know, our ships and aircraft and that we need to identify those things and make sure that our industrial base stays healthy. Bridge, yeah. yeah, just briefly, I mean, I agree with everything and the excellent kind of statement and question uh, to fully, fully agree with. I think that the, the political conception has also changed. I think, and again, clarity and concreteness about the challenge will help because, you know, 10 years ago, people would have said, well, that's, it's the free market and, you know, whatever. But if people are saying, Oh, there's a there's a highly resolute, capable, wealthy, powerful adversary that's seeking to not only undermine us in strategic competition, but maybe beat us in a war that could very is very likely to be protracted, even at best. Then we're going to need to take deliberate action because it's not like we're dealing with a fair, you know, commercial fight here. And I think especially over time, if we can pool our efforts with those of our allies, and I think AUKUS and and the the Japanese movement here, like look, the Japanese need to build up their military, right? Now, some of that should obviously be the Japanese defense industry, but also could our defense industry be selling into that and maybe vice versa where, there's, where there is single point of failure. I think the scale will provide us hopefully with more, more, more resilience and more opportunity. Yeah, and you know, the, uh, the, the pandemic's impact on the supply chain uh, is a perfect metaphor for if the Chinese decided to shut down sea lanes and trade, this is what you end up with. Yeah. And, and the supply chain for the Navy is also gonna be impacted enormously, which I think is a great point. So thank you, thank you for the question. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that's, that's all we've got time for. Um, I'd like to thank both uh, Congresswoman Loria and uh, Bridge Colby up here for their participation in a good engaging conversation about big picture and, and things that are going on the Hill. So please join me in a round of applause for these two folks.
Thank you. Pete? Thank you as well. From, um, on behalf of FC International Naval Institute, we thank Congresswoman Luria Bridget Colby. And we have uh, for, and we also thank our moderator, Admiral Moran. We've got uh, Sailor's Bookshelf, Naval Institute Press Book, written by Jim Stavridis with an FCA bookmark for each of you. And uh, let's give one more hand for an excellent discussion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now moving into a networking break in the exhibit hall, sponsored by Aleut Federal. A panel session discussion on what changes should be made to the DOD acquisition process to accelerate and adapt to meet the future will begin at 10.15. Additionally, there are also presentations in the Navy Information Warfare Theater, the Marine Corps Theater, the West Theater, and the Innovation Showcase throughout the day. Please check the app for the most up-to-date schedule and a full list of all the sessions and speakers.